first, you'll have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, how can I help you today? Ah yes, hello. I'm just phoning you as I have seen an advertisement on your website for a property that I'm interested in renting. If possible, I'd like to find out some more information before I organise a viewing. No problem at all. What is the address of the property that you'd like to inquire about? It's 21 North Avenue. OK, what is it that you'd like to know? First of all, I'd like to know what facilities the office has, as I need to make sure that it'll be suitable for my advertising company. I see. The office contains a large open plan space with a wide frontage onto a busy street with lots of passers-by, so your business would have a really good street presence. There is also a toilet and newly refurbished kitchen equipped with a dishwasher and oven. Wow, that sounds great. I'd definitely like to register my interest. OK, perfect. I just need to take some details from you, if that's OK. What is your full name? Jonathan Smith. And what position do you hold in your company, Jonathan? Until recently I was sales manager. However, I've recently been promoted to regional manager, so I'll be in charge of running our new office. Can I ask where the office is located? Yes, of course. It's located downtown just around the corner from Royal Square Shopping Centre. Hmm, that's a bit too far out of the centre for my liking. I'd much prefer to be located in close proximity to the station. Do you have any property located in that vicinity? It would help me to narrow down the results if you could tell me how many employees you intend to have working in the office. Our branch is made up of 30 employees, and we'd like some extra space for meetings and presentations. Most average office spaces are around 8,000 square feet, but it sounds like you would need more space than that. I think that 10,000 square feet would be more suitable for your needs. Now, let's see, we have 10 properties that match those criteria, so let's try and narrow it down. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Do you have any other requirements? Well, we'll need access to the office 12 hours a day, but security should be 24 hour. We don't hold any money on the premises, but it's crucial that we protect our customer information against theft. OK, anything else? Yes, ideally I would prefer the new office to be split over two levels, so that the working office area is kept separate from street level. That will enable us to locate a reception at ground floor level to welcome customers when they arrive. And are there any particular facilities that you need? Our employees work very hard throughout the day, and I want to make sure that they're well nourished. It would therefore be ideal if I could provide them with a kitchen to cook hot meals at lunchtime. Would you want the kitchen to be located at first floor level with the office? No, I don't want the office to be filled with the smell of food. It would be better if the new office had a basement where we could locate the kitchen and staff room area to keep it at arm's length from the workspace. OK, I have now narrowed the search to two available properties. Do you have any other requirements that could narrow our search down to one result? All of our office staff will be working at desktop computers so I'll need the office to be equipped with at least 40 power sockets, if possible. Anything else? Studies have shown that exercise is very important for maintaining happiness and healthy brain function. In an office environment, it's very difficult to get sufficient daily exercise, 
so it would be great if they had access to a nearby exercise area. One of the available offices is located next door to a gym. Would this be suitable? Yes, absolutely. A gym is exactly what I was thinking of. Brilliant. Do you need the office to be furnished? I don't think so. I already have some furniture, so I would prefer to bring this myself. That's no problem at all. Ah, and before I forget, we will definitely require Wi-Fi access, as much of our work and customer recruitment is carried out online. No problem. It sounds like the property will suit your needs perfectly. I've taken the liberty of booking you a viewing at 3pm on Thursday, so you can see it for yourself. Is there anything else I can help you with today? No, I think that's all the information I need. Thanks very much for your help. No problem. It's been my pleasure to be of assistance. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the education officer in a museum giving a talk to school students who are about to start a one-week work placement in the museum. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome. We're really pleased that you're going to be joining us next week for your work placement. Now, each of you will already have met the member of museum staff assigned to supervise you. In this short talk today, I'll be giving you more general information which will be relevant to all six of you. Your normal working day is 9 to 5 p.m., but on Monday, because it's your first day, we'd like you to arrive at quarter to nine. Please note, though, that you'll finish at the usual time. A lot of you have been asking what you should wear for work. Well, you may have noticed that we're not exactly a formal institution, so you'd really be out of place if you wear smart attire like a suit. If you go out on a trip with us, then we'd like you to wear a museum cap. It has our logo on, and we feel it helps people recognise you. But on a day-to-day -day basis in the museum itself, we say put on your own casual clothing because you'll be doing lots of dusty, messy work. Now... We don't have an enormous number of rules, but work placement is an excellent preparation for the real world of work, and we expect you to be very punctual and reliable. If you're not well, or there's been a hold-up, then what we ask you to do is ring the museum receptionist. He will be in the museum well ahead of opening time, and he'll inform your own personal supervisor in the museum. If you're away for more than one day, we'll inform your school tutor. They'll obviously need to make a note of your absence and follow up if necessary. But most of all, we hope you really enjoy yourselves during the placement. Students say they have a lot of fun, whether it's working with kids in our art workshops held every Monday or, the most popular, when they go out on our outreach work to residential homes, recording elderly people's memories of school days for our oral history project. So, we hope you feel excited by the prospect of starting next week and well prepared. 
Your personal supervisor will be there to help you with our health and safety requirements when you start next week, and your supervisors will also brief you about the background to the museum, summarising all the huge amount of information on our website. In the next couple of days, it might be worthwhile if you get hold of evaluations and other notes made by students who've worked with us before. You can get a lot of pointers from them. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, before I finish today, I wanted to help you find your way around the museum. When you start next Monday, the first thing you'll need to do is sign in. Come through the main entrance and you'll see the main staircase straight ahead. To the right of this is the statue of the horse and just behind that is a door. Go through that and that's the sign-in office. Now, on the first day, you'll be working in Gallery 1. You'll find this as follows. In the central courtyard area, close to the entrance, there's a large chest where visitors put donations for the museum. The door just behind that leads to Gallery 1. The workshop you'll be taking part in starts at 11, but if you want to go in earlier, you can get the key and let yourself in. The key box is quite hard to find. Walk behind reception, and it's between the large gallery and the bookshop. I haven't mentioned breaks, um, lunch, etc. Unfortunately, our cafe's closed at the moment, so your best bet is to bring a packed lunch. We tend to have our sandwiches in the kitchen area. Go round the reception desk and you'll see a small circular cabinet. The door to the kitchen area is just behind that. Now, every day we put up notices about what's happening in the museum. Your supervisor will brief you, but if you want to check up on details, look on our staff notice board. This is in the corner of the play area at the back, on the wall of Gallery 3. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to help. That is the end of Part 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between a business student called Marco and his personal tutor about the courses that Marco should take. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23 on page 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi Marco, come in. Thanks. I've got a bit stuck trying to select courses for next semester. Could you help me please? Of course. Sit down. Oh. First of all, most people just go for the areas of business that they're interested in. But even if something doesn't look very stimulating, it's important that you can use it once you get a job. 
It's not much good choosing areas that aren't going to be helpful later on. Right. I want to go into management, so I'll need to think about that. And should I start specialising in a particular area yet? I don't think that's wise at this stage. It's better to aim for a wide variety of subjects, especially as management covers so many possibilities. You shouldn't be limiting your choices for later on. Yes, I see. You should also look at how the course is made up. Will you have regular seminars and tutorials, for example, as well as lectures? OK. Some of the lecturers are quite big names in their fields, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Should I aim to go to their courses? Well, remember that the lecturers who aren't well-known may still be very good teachers. I'd say we have a consistently high standard of teaching in this department, so you don't need to worry about it. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30 on pages 5 and 6. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Good. Well, that's a great help. Now, last time we met, you mentioned doing team management, didn't you? That's right. I'm still quite keen on the idea. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that because of changes in the content of various courses, team management overlaps with the Introduction to Management course you took in your first year. Oh. So what you learned from it would be too little for the amount of time you'd have to spend on it. I'll drop that idea then. Have you had a chance to look at the outline I wrote for my finance dissertation? I left it in your pigeonhole last week. Yes. Why exactly do you want to write a dissertation instead of taking the finance modules? It'll be pretty demanding. Well, I'm quite prepared to do the extra work because I'm keen to investigate something in depth instead of just skating across the surface. I realise that a broader knowledge base may be more useful to my career, but I'm really keen to do this. Hmm, right. Well, I had a quick look through your outline, and the first thing that struck me was that you'll have to be careful how you set about it, as the way you've organised it seems unnecessarily complex. The data that you want to collect and analyse is potentially valuable, but you'll need to narrow down the subject matter to make the whole thing manageable. OK. I'll have another look at it. I was talking to Professor Briggs about it yesterday, and I got some more ideas then. For part of the dissertation, I was thinking of trying to persuade finance managers from three or four companies to let me ask them about their company finances. Mm -hmm. If not, I think I'll have to change to another topic. Well, go ahead then. I could give you some names. Thanks. Now, let's talk about practicalities. Your dissertation must be finalised by the end of May, so you should aim to finish the first draft by the end of March. Is that feasible? Yes, it shouldn't be a problem. I'll need to register for the dissertation, won't I? Is that with the registrar's department? No, it's internal to this department, so you just need to let the secretary know. Do that as soon as you're sure you're going to write the dissertation. OK. Then, to analyse your statistics, you're going to need some suitable software. If I were you, I'd drop into the computer office and ask them for a copy. Right. So, if I revise my outline... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about security in the UK. Listen to the talk and complete the statements below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In large cities, for instance London, and crowded places such as airports and stations, there is the risk of theft. We do not want you to suffer the distress of losing important documents and valuables as soon as you step onto British soil. So here are some important do's and don'ts. Don't carry more cash than you need for daily expenses. If you stay at a hotel, do ask the manager to keep large sums of cash, documents and valuables in the hotel safe and give you a receipt for them. This is a free service. If cash is stolen, it is very unlikely to be recovered. Do keep separately a note of the serial numbers on your traveller's cheques, so if they are lost you can inform your bank. Do take particular care of bank and credit cards. Do carry wallets and purses in an inside pocket or a handbag. Don't ever leave a bag unattended and make sure it is securely fastened when you are carrying it. Do carry jewellery and valuables such as cameras, radios and typewriters on you or with you and keep a note of any serial numbers. Do take special care of your passport, travel tickets and other important documents. Documents are at risk particularly at airports and stations where it is obvious that most people will be carrying them. Do make a note and keep it in a safe place of the number of your passport, its date and place of issue. This makes replacement easier if you are unlucky enough to lose it. If you don't want to carry heavy luggage around with you, you can leave it in a luggage office at most large stations and pick it up later. Keep the receipt so that you can reclaim your luggage. Check the opening hours or you may find your luggage locked away when you need it again. If you lose any of your luggage in transit, take this up immediately with the officials of the airline or shipping line. But don't worry too much. 98% is found within three days. If you lose anything, go first to the lost property office at the airport or station, as it may have been found and handed in. If you lose your luggage in the street, or suspect it has been stolen rather than gone astray, find the nearest policeman who will advise you what to do. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.